Would you go camping after hearing these stories? If you have any creepy camping experiences yourself, I'd love for you to share. Before we start these stories, all I ask is to comment, share, like, and subscribe so the YouTube algorithm knows I exist. And without further ado, here are 30 minutes of true camping horror stories. When I was a kid, my mom told the scariest stories. We would beg her to tell one and always regret it after. This one really stuck with me. I don't know why. It's not a campfire story, but close enough. She had taken me, my siblings, and two of my friends to a nearby mountain, and we had spent the whole day hiking around. When we got back to the minivan, we discovered the side door had been left open. We all laughed, didn't think much of it, and piled in. The sun was setting, and my friends were begging to hear one of my mom's famous scary stories, but I was begging them not to. Eventually, she relented and started telling this tale. It started by describing the very day we just had, climbing around on the mountain rocks, having a good time. But unbeknownst to us, something was crawling down the mountain toward the parking lot. She described this creature in great detail. It was human, but missing its eyes, so it had to sniff around at the leaves to search for prey. It only had arms which it used to lope and drag its heavy torso across the ground, sniffing as it went. Eventually its nose proved true and it sniffed out our car, finding the open door and pulling itself in. It dragged its body underneath the back seats where we were sitting now. At this point it was dark and we were getting tired. My mother knew this and warned us not to fall asleep because, in the story, the creature waited, hiding under the seats, watching our legs dancing in front of it. It waited until we began drifting off, then opened his mouth, revealing long, sharp teeth, and bit into one of our legs. The girl it bit became petrified, sitting in the seat like a frozen zombie. It went through us one by one, while the mom in the story continued driving, assuming everyone in the back has fallen asleep. At this point, IRL, we had all pulled up legs up and were clutching our knees to our chest and sweating with panic. Eventually, in the story, the mom gets to my friend's house to drop them off. She calls out to them and is surprised when no one answers back. Still, she assumes the kids are all sleeping, so she climbs out and opens the back door and is alarmed to find the children sitting in the back, eyes wide open, faces pale, and already rotting. She tries to run and call for help, but before she can go anywhere, the thing gets her too. We were so freaking terrified. We went home the entire way curled up like that and my legs ached so much. When we did get to my friend's house, my mom had to open the door for them so they could literally leap out of the car without once touching the floor of the inside of the car. My friends never asked her for another story after that, but sadly, that was far from the last scary story for me. It was a cold, dreary night with misting rains and a chilling breeze. Me and any my uncle were coming back from visiting our cousin who lived upstate. With another 20 miles to get home, we pulled off the interstate and started down a rural stretch of highway that led to our small town. Just off the edge of the interstate exit ramp, we saw a man standing in the cold rain with a bag over his shoulder and his thumb out, trying to hitch a ride. My uncle pointed the men out, look at that poor son of a bitch. I looked at my uncle, should we give him a ride? My uncle shrugged his shoulders. I pulled the car to side and the man jogged up to our window. Where are you headed, buddy? Elmdale, the man said. Elmdale was a tiny town about 15 miles up the highway. Most of the town died out after the Great Depression. There wasn't much left but a few scattered houses in the county cemetery. We agreed to give the man a ride and he climbed into the back seat of our car. My uncle and I were both pretty tired so we didn't try to make conversation, we just drove in silence. That is, until we heard giggling in the back seat. We looked in the rearview mirror. The hitchhiker had his bag, a green canvas army surplus style pack opened up. We couldn't see what was inside, but he was staring into it with a big smile on his face. He whispered into the bag, Shh, I know, 
Soon enough, they'll see. And then he giggled again. By this time, he notices we are looking in the rear view mirror at him. He hastily closes the bag and looks out the window like nothing's happened. My uncle asks, Hey buddy, what's in the bag? The hitchhiker gets an enraged look on his face. None of your damned business. Me and my uncle exchange glances. Maybe this was a bad idea. A ride in silence for a few more miles. I speed up to try and get to Elmdale faster so we can get this creep out of our car. Then we hear the whispering again. Close now, darling. Won't be long. Be ready when the time comes. Again we see that he's got his bag open and is talking down into it. I clear my throat and say, Do you have a pet in that bag or something? The hitchhiker looks bewildered. A pet? He starts looking around the car. No, I mean in your bag. What's in your bag? The hitchhiker stares defiantly back at me in the rear view mirror. None of your damn business. I push the gas pedal down further, up ahead, through the rain. I can see the edge of the county cemetery coming into view. We are close. The hitchhiker starts laughing. It's a maniacal laugh, like the kind you'd hear echoing down the hall of a psych ward. He's got his bag open, starring down inside. I hear my uncle say, fuck this, and it's all the encouragement I need. I brake hard and pull the car roughly onto the shoulder. We are just outside the cemetery gates. I throw the transmission in park and yell, get the fuck out of the car. My uncle springs from his seat in a second he's out his door and ripping open the rear passenger door. He grabs the hitchhiker and yanks him out. The hitchhiker shrieks and pulls a box cutter from his jacket. Just as he extends the blade, my uncle punches him in jaw. The hitchhiker stumbles back and takes a hard fall into a seated position. Instantly, my uncle and I are back in the car. I throw the transmission in drive and floor it. We pull away, and in the rear view, I can see the hitchhiker. He's spinning in the road, slashing air with his box cutter, shrieking at the top of his lungs. In a matter of seconds, he fades from view. The car is up to speed, and he is long gone. In the confusion, my uncle wasn't able to close the rear door. The momentum has partially pressed it closed, but it rattles, slightly ajar. My uncle reaches over the seat to pull it shut. Oh shit, he says. What? He left his bag in the back seat. We exchange glances as he pulls the bag into the front seat. Hesitantly, he pulls the flap open. His hand freezes in place, his eyes bulge. Holy shit, I ask him what it is, but he's unable to speak. Instead, he turns the bag toward me and pulls the flap all the way open so that I finally peer inside. And do you know what was in that bag? None of your dang business. Not my story, but my cousin's. He swears it's true, and I'm inclined to believe him. To preface. We live in the southern U.S., and when he was a kid, there would be lots of Hispanic families who came through our small town as migrant workers. They would stay a while taking up residence in whatever housing was available, often small, empty, rural houses outside of town. Then, when the work dried up due to harvest season ending, or the occasional immigration bust, they'd pull out of town at a moment's notice. These houses that they'd lived in would become abandoned overnight for a few months until another family took up residence there. So forth and so on. So around Christmas time in the late 80s, early 90s, my cousin and his friends are all having a sleepover at a friend's house during one of our rare snowstorms. This particular friend's dad was ex-military and had a pretty cool collection of surplus gear, namely a pair of night vision goggles. My cousin and his friends were looking through these goggles at the snowfall. They said it looked incredible through the goggles. When they noticed something strange, a nearby house which they knew to be recently abandoned due to the family pulling their son a classmate of my cousin out of school and moving away, had a single light on in the attic. So as a group of teenagers tend to do, they decided to investigate. They put on all their warm clothes and walked over to the house. When they arrived, sure enough there was light in the attic, seemingly candlelight. They were all too spooked to actually enter while someone was clearly there and resolved to return and check it out in the daylight. The next morning, they all trekked back over to the house, 
and not seeing any more light from the attic, made their way inside. As they expected, the house was completely cleared out. Now this is probably hyperbole, or a teenager's overactive imagination, but my cousin swears that when they pulled open the trapdoor to the attic, a cold wind rushed past them. As they climbed into the attic, they noticed it was just as barren as the rest of the house, save one central feature. There, in the middle of the attic, was a bloody sacrifice lamb, nailed to a crucifix. My cousin says he thinks maybe it had something to do with a weird sect of Catholicism or something, but that the scariest part to him is that they almost went into the house during whatever this ritual was. My dad used to tell this one. He said he read it in a book when he was a teenager. There was once a pastor and his wife who came from the city to an old parish in a rural area. The people of the church had driven every single pastor out of the church since its founding. No one was good enough for them, and some people said they would have found fault with the angels. The pastor and his wife didn't stand a chance. They were both heavily criticized by the members. The pastor preached the Bible too much. He preached it too little. His wife dressed up too much. His wife underdressed. The pastor was greedy and wanted all their money. The wife, Alice, was a snob. And worst of all, they were from the city. They refused to pay them enough to move away, and the couple were, unfortunately, trapped there. The criticism continued and increased and became extremely malicious until tragically Alice could take it no longer and killed herself. The very next Sunday night after the funeral, they had a business meeting. The church elders cruelly belittled the pastor for his many faults, and some even implied he was the reason his wife had died. At this final cruel criticism, there was a horrible scream, and down from the belfry came Alice, shrieking accusations at the elders. She was dressed in her funeral clothes, with her hair loose, and her eyes wild and full of hatred. They all fled. The next Sunday morning, Alice again came shrieking down. Every time the church tried to meet, there would be Alice, and they were finally forced to abandon the building after a failed exorcism. To this day, the church remains empty, and anyone that tries to buy or meet in it is driven off by the vengeful ghost of Alice. Side note, my dad is a pastor, and I always thought it was weird. He told us this ghost story about vengeful minister's wife. I was lost in the woods as night was falling. I'd been walking all day and was desperate to find somewhere to shelter. In the darkness, I came across a lonely cabin, and without even thinking, I knocked on the door. When there was no answer, I decided to try the handle. The door was unlocked. I got in and threw myself on the single bed in the middle of the room. I felt bad about breaking in, but I was exhausted and fell asleep almost instantly. In the middle of the night, I woke up, but something kept me from going back to sleep. I hadn't noticed before, but on the wooden walls hung the most sinister paintings I'd ever seen. They were portraits, horrible portraits of faces twisted in rage and fear, as if all the ugliness in the world was glaring down at me. Lying there in the dark, I shivered and somehow knew that the faces in the paintings were looking at me as an intruder and how they hated me for it. Eventually, my tiredness must have overcome my fear, and I drifted off into the darkness of a dreamless sleep. That morning, when I woke up, with the call of the forest birds flitting through the air, I opened my eyes, but I almost wished I hadn't. Because when I looked around the sagging walls, I realized that those things I'd seen the night before weren't paintings at all. They were windows. Gray Wolf 12, three year. Ago I don't have any camp stories, mostly because I never camped since it's not super popular here where I live. I do, however, have some neat stories about my life that are kind of spooky. For context, I lived most of my life near a cemetery, so it might have something to do with it. The first story I always think of is that when we first moved into the place, I was very young and shared a room with my sister and the door was always open, so the light from the hallway could be seen. I slept with a good view of the hallway. The problem is, I never was someone who simply laid down and slept, 
I remain awake for several hours, even to this day. And every night, seemingly in the clock, two shadows would walk up on the hallway towards my room. The shape wasn't from my parents. They seemed like neighbors my grandma had. But I always assumed it was my parents, and the light just made it funny. So I close my eyes and pretend to sleep. This went on for a long time. One day I decided to get up and say hi to my parents in the hallway. So I did that when the shadows showed up. There wasn't anyone in the hallway. Me and my neighbor were playing outside during the night. It was a safe place to do it. And we're like using binoculars to see stuff, walking on stairs with no lights on, trying to find ghosts. We decide to go home, it was a building, and walk up the stairs again with no lights on. Halfway through, I hear my name being called, and my friend swears he saw eyes in the dark. He screams. I scream. We run the stairs up desperate to turn it on, as I fell something nearing us. We make to the switch. Lights are on, no sign of anything behind us. We look at each other and decide to never walk up the stairs in the dark again. I never felt safe doing anything on those stairs if the lights weren't on. While growing up, I got a few plushies because I always liked collecting things, and plushies were no exception. Me and my friends are playing in my house with the plushies until we decide to go outside. My friends put the plushies they have on my bed and just go. I was lagging behind, so I just toss the one in my hand, and it lands sideways on my bed. I start going to the door until I decide I can't let the plushies laying sideways for some reason. When? I go back, it's standing up. I was the last one to go out. There was no one else in the house that day besides me and my friends. My Pikachu plushie always seems suspicious after that. My girlfriend tends to wake up during the night, and although we can't say exactly if she really wakes up or is just sort of dreaming, she did tell me that. While sleeping on my bed while I was up on the living room, sometimes I was sleeping next to her, she saw a shadowy and tall figure standing on my doorway or leaning against the desk on my room, sort of guarding her or watching her sleep. She also told me that she saw a ghostly man watching my mother sleep once, when girlfriend got up to drink water and passed my mom's room. We figured the ghost man is my grandfather, mom's dad. I have no clue about the shadow guy, but he seems alright. Feel free to distort and enhance this stories for better effect, and overall, more spookiness. Myself and a group of friends were on a hiking trip during the summer. We decided to stop for the night on the shore of a large lake. We got our tents set and a campfire started before nightfall. We had cooked dinner and were having a good time around the fire in the dark. Our group was telling stories and laughing it up when we saw a light turn on, then off directly across the lake from us. We thought nothing of it and continued enjoying the night and fire. A short while later, we saw the same light turn on then off. This time the light was a further left from us down the opposite shoreline. Through the night, we watched the light slowly get closer and closer. When the light was almost half a mile down the shoreline from us, we went off into the woods from camp. We waited a short while and watched as a group of men walked into camp with ropes and shotguns. They began to search around our campsite. One of the men was about to walk our direction into the woods when we heard laughing in the distance. The group of men left our camp without saying anything and continued down the shore from us. We waited a little while before emerging from the woods. Our group immediately packed up and began hiking in the opposite direction of where the men had gone to. We decided to cut our hiking trip short and return home. I was overcome with curiosity and began researching disappearances in that area of the woods. I found a number of stories about unsolved cases where groups of campers would go missing without any trace around that lakey. No bodies have ever turned it up for any of the missing people. It gives me chills thinking about what could have happened if we hadn't gone into the woods. What could have happened had there not been laughter from another part of the shoreline? What became of the other people cluelessly enjoying their night? If you ever find yourself camping around the San Gabriel Mountains, you can tell this one. Years before written history, Native Americans that lived in the area told stories of the people that lived in the mountains, men that came at dusk. I haven't heard their oral histories, and many of these things are kept hidden and secret from those that aren't members of the tribe, 
and even then rarely spoken of. I can tell you of the accounts I've read and of what I experienced in those hill about six years ago. Six years ago, around February, I had just been released from Marine Corps boot camp and was spending a week with my family before heading back to Marine Combat School. Anyway, I got into a spat with my sister when I got back. She and her boyfriend had been smoking pot near my military stuff, and I couldn't have it smelling like weed. They got defensive, and it ended up with me out on my ass for the A-Day, so I take a trip to the hills. Figured I can at least keep myself in shape. I get to the entrance of one of my favorite trails a little after noon, a place called Hermit Falls, an easy hike that ends with a place you can cliff jump off of into a couple of craters filled with water. The hike was nothing special. Neither was the time I spent sunning and jumping into the water. There's always someone there since it's pretty popular, so I spent most of my time bullshitting with locals and talking about how badass boot camp was like the brainwashed boot I was, at some point I decided I'd close my eyes and rest a bit, and that was my mistake, when I woke up. The sun had already gone behind the valley the craters made, and it cast the falls in a premature night. I immediately was wide awake thinking how screwed I was. I grabbed my bag, I had been using it as pillow, threw on a shirt, pulled on my boots, and started back up the trail. I patted myself down, as I was walking down making sure I hadn't left anything and looked back to give the ground a quick search when my throat caught. I'd gotten up high enough that the red of the sun over the valley was just visible. Standing in a semicircle around the falls were five motionless men, completely shadowed by the red light behind them. Then I heard a shuffle of bushes behind me and flipped around thinking I was going to be attacked. Instead, on the other side of the river that led into the falls, was another man, still shrouded by shadow, but more detailed. I could see a hat long-brimmed, and he carried a walking stick in one hand. He extended a hand and beckoned. Before turning and disappear without noise into the brush, momentarily stunned, I looked back to where the other five had been, but the sunlight had faded completely, and even if they'd still been there, I wouldn't have been able to make them out. Then, like a pop. The sound of crickets and frogs came out of nowhere, like they'd always been there, but the noise had been suppressed. I ran back to my car, went home, and didn't talk about it until a few years after that when a buddy of mine mentioned the shadow people. I told him, and we looked into it together, found articles and articles on them. They show up all over the country, but one the one with the walking stick, has been sighted multiple times in the mountains in California. There's a lot of lore around him, and most of it is Native American, though I can't remember the tribe or tribes. If you take the time to look into it, you'll see what I mean. Sometimes. I wonder what would have happened had I followed him. Most of the time I try not to think about it. Story 9 this is something I posted a while back, but Fitz posted this a few months back to a similar question. Fourteen years ago, I went camping with my girlfriend, wife now, off the Appalachian Trail in the North Georgia mountains. We camped about 100 yards off a fire road, which we drove up in my truck. I had firewood in the bed of my truck I chose not to haul to the campsite. I noticed just before dark, the quantity of firewood seemed lower than I remembered. I thought nothing of it at the time, as we were a 45 minute drive from anywhere and was fairly certain there were no other hikers or campers close by. Nearing midnight, I decided to get a couple more pieces of wood. My wife was not comfortable being alone in the woods, so she walked to the truck with me. There was no moon that night, so I grabbed my flashlight. I also grabbed my gun. My wife asked me more than once if a gun was really necessary. When we got to my truck, we heard rustling about 20 feet away in the fire road. I shone my light in that direction, and we see a middle-aged man and two teenaged boys. They were filthy with tattered clothes, certainly no hikers. Think the movie Deliverance, the man asked. Y'all got any sticks? I replied, nope. 
grabbed the last couple pieces of wood and returned to our campsite. I told my wife within their earshot. That's why I brought a gun. Never saw nor heard them again. Story 10. My cousin's house has a pretty large backyard with a standalone garage that was converted to a one bedroom. He rents out the garage to a family friend. This cousin also has a habit of sleeping with his window completely open. This same window faces the backyard. One morning, my cousin was doing some work in the backyard, and the neighbor who lived in the garage told him that last night there was a very slender, tall, and pale man walking in circles in the backyard. This someone would also periodically stop by my cousin's window and peer into his room. This went on for about 20 minutes. The neighbor thought it was a friend of my cousin's, but my cousin told him he didn't have a friend which fit that description, nor had he invited someone to the house last night. Story 11. My cousin was pretty freaked out and told this story to a couple of friends, and one friend had a similar experience. This friend was hanging out with a friend in his garage one night. After some pizza and drinks, his guest passed out, and he decided to go use the bathroom before calling it a night. When he came back from the bathroom, he saw a tall, pale, and slender figure hunched over, staring right into the face of his sleeping guest. He was shocked, scared, and quickly closed the door and called the police. The police asked him to check and see if the invader was still in the garage. When he opened the door, the invader was no longer there. I am going to set the scene first. We are at my girl scout camp. This year, my troop was placed in the camping section furthest away from the entrance, deep in the woods. There is a clearing and large field behind the camping section. My troop leader points to the clearing and field. She asks if we knew what building once stood in the field. We all said no, and she explains it was an insane asylum. It burnt down many years ago, she explains. While it was on fire, many of the patients escaped. Some were found. She puts her head down, and some were never found. They suspect they, well, still roam the campgrounds. Everything pauses for a second. All of a sudden, my troop heard running in the woods, followed by voices, banging on the main cabin, too. My troop leader lifts her head back up and asks, Do you know what the patients liked most? The troop in unison said, No. She screams and lunges at us, little girls, and another troop leader darts out of the woods, scaring the crap out of us. Shout out to my fellow Girl Scouts, I hope y'all are well. Story 12 This one came from my grandpa, and I've told it to many at Girl Scout camp. Also, fair warning, it's a bit gory. It was a calm and quiet night. The fog was thick, and it was a new moon. A young girl stood in the middle of a clearing surrounded by thousands of trees in every direction. The girl had run away from home in the dead of night. As far as she knew, she was all alone. She laid down to rest, but someone, something, was watching. Her screams could be heard throughout the entire wood as she was brutally mauled by a rabbit wolf. The last thing she saw as the life drained from her eyes was the ravenous gaze of the wolf. The next day, her parents searched far and wide for the young girl, but all they found was her mangled nightgown in her left hand. The two were devastated, and they locked themselves in their cabin for weeks. After a month had passed, their neighbor decided to check on them. However, nobody was there, but there was one thing that made his stomach turn. On the dining room was the severed left hands of the girl's parents. Two days later, the neighbor disappeared as well, and his left hand showed up on his doorstep. One by one, the rest of the village went missing, and all that remained of the people that once lived there was a bunch of severed left hands. As a bonus, you can leave the fire before the rest of the group, and leave a fake left hand. I got mine from a Halloween store. At the, the entrance to your cabin tent before going and hiding nearby. Then... Wait for the inevitable chaos and panic. Story 13. Me and my wife have a knack for going off the beaten path when we travel. One night, while on our way to see family in New England, 
we find a cute town not too far from the highway to rest for the night. Of course, we choose the local inn rather than a hotel chain. As we step into the inn, I see some flyers for local trails and points of interest. I also see a flyer titled, Come Visit the Haunted Hill Farm Inn, which was the inn we were staying in. I jokingly ask reception about the haunting. She claimed the haunted room was room 103, but that they didn't rent out that room anymore. Too many complaints, nightmares, early checkouts, and even some physical injury that caused some legal concern for the establishment. I assume it's all to draw business. We grab our room's old style skeleton key and head down the hallway to our room. My wife points out along the way, Look honey, it's room 103. Of course we can't get in or anything, but I decided to look through the keyhole and found red. Nothing but the color red. Not necessarily a crimson red, a little darker than that. I stood up, shrugged, and off we went onto our room, slept well, and checked out the next morning. While we were checking out, I asked, so what's supposed to be in room 103? Some kind of ghost? The receptionist replied, the ghost of a young woman haunts that room. The story is that when she reveals herself, she floats, wears a colonial style nightgown, has straight black hair, and deep red eyes. Story 14. My brother told me this. An old man lived in the mountains alone with his dogs. He hated people. The one he did love was food. He loved to eat, and he loved to hunt, and loved whistling a tune while hunting one day. There was no game in the woods, and he went home empty-handed. He was angry, but he couldn't do anything about his empty stomach. He was putting a log into the fire when he stopped. He heard a scratching moist above him. He looked up, he saw the tail of... something? The thing was trying to get in through the roof. The old man didn't think twice. He grabbed his hunting knife and sliced the tail off the thing. Let out a screech that shook the ground and bolted. He saw a glimpse of the thing. It was black and was on all fours. The dogs chased it a bit. The man didn't care about the thing. He was looking at the tail. It was long and thick. Blood was seeping out of the top. He pondered about what the thing was. He pondered about the tail. Then he thought about his empty stomach. The old man took a metal spike and put it through the tail. He set it on the fire. The bold man's mouth watered. As the smell of meat filled his house, fur burnt away, leaving sweet meat. Finally, he took a chunk out of the tail and ate. It was delicious, piece by piece. He ate it, throwing chunks for his dogs to eat after his meal. He let his dogs out for the night and laid in bed just as he was about to drift off. He heard a tapping at the window. Then he heard something else. A voice, a crackling, demonic voice that spoke. Give me back my tail. Give me my tail back. He got up and opened his window. He shouted, dogs get that ugly weasel. The dogs chased it away. The old man laid down again and drifted off to sleep. Bang, 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 the old man awoke with a start to the sound of his door being banged on. The voice came back. Give me my tail back. Give me my tail back. The old man jumped up and opened his window. Dogs get that ugly weasel, but the dogs were gone. The thing had eaten them up. Crash. The man whipped around to see his door had been broke down, and the thing crawled inside. Give me my tail back. The last thing he saw was the creature's teeth. The old man was never found, but sometimes in the dead of night you can still hear the sound of him whistling a tune. Story 15. It is said that during World War II, many crimes took place in what is currently Albania. Lots of people had to escape from their homes to the forests, which are large and deep in that area. As a result, many simple wooden cabins were built to try to keep themselves safe. Nowadays, these cabins are abandoned as they were assembled in a hurry and not prepared for long-term living. This story took place not that long ago, maybe 15 or 20 years. An experienced, lonely hunter was spending some time in one of those forests. However, the day was not going well as he had not managed to hunt anything. The sun was starting to go down, 
and soon it would be completely dark, making it difficult for him to find his way back, even with his experience. Frustrated after the third day in a row of leaving empty-handed, he continued walking, contemplating what to do. Suddenly, he stumbled upon one of those wooden cottages built during World War II, a place he knew well. Most of the time, they were empty and abandoned, serving as cold shelters for animals or people with nowhere else to stay. But this one seemed different, clean and tidy, even in the poor light from the setting sun. He thought maybe it belonged to someone, and if he could spend the night there, he would have a couple of extra hours to try to hunt something. As he approached the door, he discovered it was open, and the inside was unbelievable. Not only did it have a fireplace with prepared wood, but also a sofa, chairs, and a table. He even found a room with a clothed bed. Excited about this incredible discovery, he lit the fireplace to warm up the house and used the unexpected time to plan his hunting strategy. Exactly two and a half hours later, he returned still empty-handed but happy that, at least, he would have a warm and seemingly safe place to spend the night. The fireplace had done its job, and the house was heated, revealing more details in the increased light. He saw the chairs, the table, the sofa, and then he spotted the paintings. The walls were filled with ultra-realistic, horrifying pictures. Chills ran down his spine as he observed a man hanging in a dark chamber, a pile of assumed dead bodies rotting in a forest, and the worst one, a sofa with three little kids dressed like dolls, mummified. The realism was astonishing, and he didn't dare to look at them closely. Disturbed, he took his rifle and headed to the bedroom, questioning the kind of weirdo who painted those pictures, and in the name of which God he ended up in such a place. Even in the room, there was another horrible picture. A lonely, flimsy man with pale skin, hideous, creepy yellow eyes looking directly at him, and its mouth disgustingly sewed shut. He covered himself in the bed as fast as he could, hooging his riffle shacking, and cursing Hoover had such an awful taste in art. It took a long time for him to fall asleep, but during the process, he didn't open his ears even once. I would like to tell you that something horrifying happened that night, something that would traumatize all who hear this story. But I'd be lying. The truth is that early the next morning, the hunter opened his eyes to find the room filled with morning sunlight. Still a bit frightened, he took his rifle, left that creepy place, and returned home. I don't know if he lived a long, happy life or if he went back to that forest even to that same cabin. But what I do know is that that morning, when he woke up, he noticed something that would haunt him for the rest of his life. There were no paintings in the cabin, just windows. Story 16. I don't really have a story you would tell, but I do have a story from a time I was around a campfire. It was New Year's Eve 2015, and we were camping out in the desert in Southern California. It was a camping spot on BLM land, kinda in the middle of nowhere. Right before we started a campfire for the night, we all dropped a bunch of acid. The night was absolutely amazing. The stars out there are so incredible. It seems like you can see the entire universe. We saw multiple shooting stars and satellites passing overhead. We were all pretty deep in the hippie game, playing with fire, giving light shoes and massages. All around it was a really amazing night. As the ball dropped, we all took some MDMA and got settled into another nice come up. At around 1.30 a.m., we noticed heat lights coming from the desert. The only road that I knew of in that array was in the opposite direction, and I've been camping at this exact spot since I was 16, and had never seen anyone. As the vehicle got closer, we realized it was an older pickup truck but had giant floodlights all around it, so it looked incredibly intimidating. It pulled about 50 yards away from us facing us, so our entire campsite was fairly lit up. I just remember everyone kind of being deer in the headlights as I slowly went to grab the axe that was next to my camping chair. After what seemed like forever, 
The truck turned off, its lights and engine, and we couldn't hear or see anything coming from that direction. At that point, we were all fairly certain we were about to be murdered. Two guys and four girls to whoever they had in the truck. All we had was an axe, a knife, and some longer, thicker firewood. We armed ourselves with what we had and just kind of waited to see or hear something. After about 30 minutes, nothing happened. And after an hour, we had all completely forgot that the truck was even there. The drugs brought us back to a chill night. Not soon after that, they made their first move and we were unprepared. All of a sudden, out of the darkness, we hear a loud pop. We panic for a moment, and then we see it. A bright flash in the sky. A fucking firework. They light off a few more over the course of the hour, and then drive off around 3 a.m. To this day, it was still the scariest and strangest thing I've encountered while camping or in the wilderness. Story 17. The summer camp that I went to, and was later a counselor at, had all of the cabins down a long wooden boardwalk that was slightly elevated and overlooking the edge of the lake. It was the woods of Maine, so it wasn't sandy or anything. It was very rocky and dense forest. There were 13 cabins and one extra cabin by another name that was built up further from the boardwalk between cabins 10 and 11. The story goes that there actually used to be 14 cabins, but this was before there was indoor plumbing, and instead just a few outhouses between cabins 10 and 11. One night, a camper left cabin 14 to go to the bathroom, but he never came back. Concerned, another camper followed, and they also never returned. One by one, all of cabin 14, including the counselor, wandered into the woods, trying to find the others and never returned. Eventually, they tore down cabin 14 and built the unique extra cabin where the outhouses were in the hopes that the missing campers would eventually return back to the cabin they all disappeared from. They say that you can still sometimes see their flashlights searching through the woods, with the beams slightly illuminating each cabin though the windows. This terrified me as a camper, especially because the adults would occasionally be moving around outside, cleaning up, taking a sick camper to the nurse, etc. So I could see the flashlights from time to time and hear people moving outside. In retrospect though, the boardwalk literally ended at the door of cabin 13 and physically could not have continued any further. But boy did it scare me. Story 18. This isn't a camping story, but it might work with some others. When I was young, I was always afraid of cars coming to life on their own and trying to run me over. I saw the headlights as eyes and the grill as the mouth, long, long, long before the movie Cars came out. Whenever a ball would roll under a car parked in the driveway and get stuck, I would be freaked out reaching under to push it out. In middle school, we had an assignment to write about an irrational fear we had. Turns out several kids had the same fear as me, which seemed weird. We were talking about it at lunch, and a friend said he bets it's because of Miss X. Turns out, before nap time when we were four, she used to just read to us whatever book she was reading herself, which included Christine by Stephen King. The friend said when he started reading the book, he was trying to figure out why it sounded so familiar and put the two together. A couple years later, I saw Miss X and asked her about it, and she confirmed said she thought it wouldn't matter what she was reading to us, as long as she read it in a soothing voice. Along the same lines, I was also afraid of sewer drains, because I was flipping through TV channels one day, and stopped when I saw a paper boat floating toward a gutter, and a boat in a raincoat chasing it. Story 19 La Llorona, here's one of the versions I know of her from my Mexican childhood. There once was a beautiful woman. New to a small, quiet town, she sold flowers that she grew for a living. All the men of the town loved her, but she married one who she had two children with, a boy and a girl, a strong, supporting husband who later died in the war, devastated she never married again. And soon the townsmen caught on to this. With vengeance, they went to her house and burned it, killing the two children inside. She made it out alive, but now filled with more sadness and anger. She swore a curse on the town to watch out for their kids, as she would bring upon the same fate that they gave her, 
Eventually, the story molded into the countless version that exists. But the name of the town is said to be forgotten and eventually covered up by nature's forest. She now roams around looking for children to take as she mourns, Oh, my children, in the darkness around. Of course, I changed a few things to fit the campfire. The town isn't forgotten. Everyone knows where it is. But it still fits one of the versions of the story. Some others are... Her house caught fire and running to put it out. She left her kids in a boat and the drowned in the rapids, or she killed her own children from the sadness of her husband dying. And many more, which I can't remember. Story 20. I don't know if this counts as a campfire story, but I do bring it up sometimes when I go camping. Two years ago, I was camping with my friend and her boyfriend at the time. Somewhere in the Okanogan National Forest, we didn't bring tents, just planned to sleep in the bed of our trucks and keep driving that next morning. My friend had a shell on hers, which she and her boyfriend slept in, and mine was just open. I brought lots of blankets and an insulated sleeping bag. By the time the sun fully set, around 9 or 10 p.m., we decided to go to sleep. I got in my sleeping bag and covered my head with the blankets so that I was totally covered with a little hole for my mouth so I could breathe. I fell asleep pretty quickly. Listening to the breeze in the trees puts me right to sleep. I suddenly woke up to a lot of movement. My truck was moving quite a lot, like it was being rocked side to side, so much that I was physically unable to keep myself totally still. It would stop for a few minutes, then happen again. My mind was racing, trying to figure out what could be doing this. There was only a light breeze that night, definitely nothing strong enough to move the truck that much. I figured then that it must be a curious bear, but soon realized that it was not a bear. I've encountered bears in this same area before. They sniff, huff, and generally make lots of noise when they dig through your stuff. I heard none of this. I thought maybe it was a mountain lion, but I've never encountered or even heard of a mountain lion doing something like this. If they happen upon your campsite, they generally just pass through unless you have food laying out in the open. With a sinking feeling in my stomach, I thought it might be a person, which scared me more than both the bear and mountain lion option. But I have no idea how one person, or even two, could rock the truck back and forth to that degree. It isn't a large vehicle, but easily weighs over a ton. Regardless, I just tried to focus on laying totally still until the morning. I sang songs in my head to distract myself. My body was cramping so bad, but I wouldn't allow myself to move until the morning. The rocking happened off and on all night and happening less and less closer to daylight. I remember suddenly hearing birds singing and mustered the courage to remove the blankets from my head. I sat up and took a quick look around the area. Nothing out of the ordinary. I checked the time on my phone. It was about 4.30 a.m. The sun rises very early there in the summer, and it was decently bright at this point. I leaned over the side of the bed to look at the ground for footprints. I saw nothing except my own footprints leading from our fire pit to my truck, and they were obviously my own footprints, small feet, pattern of the sole matches my shoes. The ground was very dusty, as it often is in the middle of summer, and there was no grass in the area my truck was parked. I got out and decided to check the truck for any damage. I saw a very noticeable set of scratches that looked like they had been made by claws. I don't have a picture to show, as the truck is in storage for the winter, and I've gotten a new phone since then. I got back in my sleeping bag, and listened to music waiting for my friends to wake up. It was around five or six that I heard the doors open. I sat up to look at my friend. She looked very tired and noticeably worried and confused. I asked her if she'd heard anything weird last night. She paused for a moment before saying yes, lots of strange noises underneath her truck and near the doors. She said it sounded like scratching and pulling, like something was trying to get in. She said her dog, which slept in her truck with them, had been awake all night pacing and whining. I told her what happened to me last night, 
and we looked for more footprints and anything that seemed out of place all over the campsite, and we found nothing. Her boyfriend came outside a few minutes later and said he had weird dreams. He is a heavy sleeper, but me and my friend are not. We were justifiably pretty freaked out. We packed everything up and left within the hour. Still have no idea what that was all about. Maybe I was dreaming or making it up somehow, but it's strange to me how my friend experienced something very similar. Story 21. When I was 13, I went to a camping event hosted by my school and only my best friend and me were the attendees from our class. We did a lot in that camping. We played games. We were children guides, so technically we only guided them. And then the time came for the huge campfire. Then we were told to do some sort of chant that actually creeped me out because the fire went larger when we said those words. Then a few minutes after, one of the senior scouts, who was my upper class man, came up to me and my best friend. He told us, make sure to lock and zip your tent. While we were sitting down the campfire, we asked him why, he just said we should do it, and of course we did. Why would we leave it open anyway? Then 2 a.m. come, the same guy called for us, and we opened our tent, and he said, zip your tent, he might come. He said, and we wondered who he was. At this point, we were getting more scared because it was 2 a.m. We asked him who he was again, and he whispered eagle. And we just kind of froze. The eagle scout for our school was a 17, 18 year old student. And we remembered we just talked to him in the past hour. And we were even dancing to music before we went to our tent. The next morning, the same guy ran up to us with one of the female senior scouts and said, the eagle was sitting outside of your tent last night, waiting for you to wake up. And I remembered, I almost shit my pants that moment. The same eagle in this kept following me and my friend around like a stalker for weeks. It only stopped because school was canceled due to COVID. He sat next to us in lunch. He walked behind us during breaks and dismissals. And I remember he sometimes touched me. And I remember one time he removed my belt in the second scouting day and slipped it in again as he kept touching my body while doing that. Still gives me the creeps. I don't know if this is a campfire story, but some of it was told during a campfire. It wasn't really a story, it was just the plain truth. It still creeps me out because it was true. Story 22 One night a while back, a teenage girl's parents have gone out for the night and it's her first time alone for the night. She's sure she'll be okay as she's got her dog to keep her company. Enjoying the freedom of no parents, as it gets dark starts to get a bit spooked. You know what it's like when you're home alone. Every noise is amplified, and you assume it's something nefarious. She's laid on the sofa watching TV and falls asleep. When suddenly, an emergency broadcast wakes her up. It's about a killer on the loose in her area is played. Jumping up, she goes round the house, locking all the doors and windows with her dog closely following. She decides to go to bed as it's getting late and as she's a bit spooked, she'll keep her dog under the bed to keep her safe. She slowly drifts off, but is awakened by a faint dripping off in the distance. Too sleepy to get up and check, she puts her hand under the bed, pats her dog, and he gives a reassuming lick back, and she falls asleep. Again, she is woken by dripping. She puts her hand under the bed and receives another reassuring lick but this time, can't get back to sleep. She decides to investigate and calls her dog to come with her, but he doesn't follow. She doesn't think much of it, but goes on anyway. First she goes downstairs to check the kitchen, but everything seems fine in there, although she can still hear the dripping. She goes back upstairs to check the bathroom. It's dark, but as she enters, she immediately feels whatever was causing the dripping all over the floor. She turns on the light to find her trusty dog slumped over the shower rail, throat slit, blood dripping on the tiled floor. As she scans the rest of the room, she sees, scrawled in the dog's blood across the bathroom mirror, humans can lick too. Story 23. A bunch of my friends and me were camping, and there's a little chapel in the woods and a bike path and other little things like that. 
Well, on this trip there was also some people who came that none of us liked, and they were getting on our nerves, so we left and met up at the park to talk about what we wanted to do for the rest of the evening. Some of them wanted to go on the bike path, and some of us wanted to go to the chapel and just talk and chill out, and the bike path lets out by the chapel, so they were going to meet up with us when they were off of the trail. There are two ways to get into the chapel. The main entrance, which is a small dirt path that leads to the chapel, that just tucked into the woods in the other side of the tree line, it's an open air type of chapel, and a smaller, barely ever used, almost impossible to find, especially in the dark side entrance. It was about 9.15, 9.30-ish p.m., and we were talking, and out of the corner of my eye, I see a black silhouette about 6.65 six, in height, roughly coming down the side entrance, staring directly at me and my three friends. They all notice me starting right back at this thing, and turn to see what I'm so focused on, and see the figure, and all stare at it too. We are all looking at this thing for a minute or two, and it starts moving faster down the path towards us. My friend says, hell no, and we all stand up to leave, and notice that it's moving even faster towards us. My friends screamed and we ran as fast as we could back to our bikes, just as our friends from the trail reached the main entrance to the chapel, and we took off and they started following us, and so did the figure. But it stopped, just shy of the main entrance in the dim light, and I swear it spoke bug to this day. I have no idea what it said, and my friends say the same thing. We get back to the campsites and tell our friends from the trail everything. And they stare at us until one of them says, When we were on the trail, I saw something big and tall like that black mass you saw across the swamp from the trail just watching us as we rode past. And that night, none of us slept. And we tried to distract our brains from what had happened. And thankfully, the next day, we had to leave the site. And we have never spoken about it since. And have been very weary about the swamp and the chapel ever since. And every time we have gone into the chapel or down the trail, we always say a little prayer and hope we never see it again. And whatever it was, was pure evil. And the next morning I had three scratches down my arm, which is how we know that it was evil, whatever it was. And worst of all, every little bit of this is true. And it really did happen to me and my friends. Story 24. Black Coffee. I was told this by a kid I grew up with in my old neighborhood. He said he'd heard it from his brothers, and they had heard it when they were at camp. Basically, there's husband and a wife, and the wife really loved black coffee. It may seem like a small detail, but it made sense for the rest of the plot. Essentially, for no specific reason, the man kills his wife, and he thinks he's off the hook for about a month. This is where the story starts to really get to you when you're just listening to someone narrate it. The man gets a phone call one day, he picks it up, answers it, and hears a woman say, black coffee, black coffee, ten miles away, in a sing-song type of way, and then hang up. The man is confused and a little weirded out, but puts it out of his head. A minute later, the phone rings again. He's a little trepidatious, but picks it up, and the same woman says, Black coffee, black coffee, five miles away, and hang up. The story goes on like this, with the guy getting increasingly scared, and the phone keeps ringing. He knows he shouldn't for his sake, but he keeps picking up the phone, and the woman keeps answering. With closer distances, the more he picks up, like, black coffee, black coffee, one mile away, black coffee, black coffee, standing in the driveway, black coffee, Black coffee, standing at the door. Guy runs upstairs and locks himself in his room. Black coffee, black coffee, coming up the stairs. Black coffee, black coffee, walking down the hallway. Guy locks himself in closet. Black coffee, black coffee, standing in your room. Guy closes his eyes and hears the closet door open. Black coffee, black coffee, standing right behind you. And then the story ends by saying, the guy slowly turns around and screams. I think it's great for atmosphere because even though you're just hearing about this guy get stalked by his ghost wife, you feel like you can't escape. And you can imagine his feeling of almost claustrophobic panic. Story 25. 
This is going to get buried, but every year for Halloween, our drama teacher would tell us a campfire story. It's been like 15 years, so it's not exact. One night, a family headed to a cabin to enjoy the wilderness for summer vacation. There's the father, mother, their 10-year-old son and 5-year-old daughter. The cabin was secluded out in the woods, with only a trail leading down to town, which was 20 minutes away by car. One night, a terrible storm hit. The cabin lost power, leaving the family to rely on the fireplace for light and warmth. Suddenly there was a heavy knock on the door. Knock, knock, knock. The family froze. They were so far away from town, there was no way someone would be looking for shelter. Maybe it's just the wind, the mother says softly. Knock, knock, knock. Scared, she pulls her two children in close as the father carefully moves to the window trying to see who is at the door. The angle is bad, though. He only sees an empty porch. Knock, knock, knock. Startled, he jumps back a bit. Enough of this, he huffs, grabbing his hunting rifle before throwing open the door. He stands there, confused to see there's no one there. Stay put with the kids, probably some local teenagers thinking they're funny. I'll find them and scare them off. He tells her before going out into the rain, yelling for them to come out. She hears his voice getting a bit distant before she hears him screaming, followed by gunshots. It's quiet for a moment before knock, knock, knock. The knocks are so loud the door starts to give way. Knock, knock, knock. The door drops to the floor, and in the doorframe is a large coffin. Nothing happens for a moment before it starts to move towards them. They scream the mother moving in front of her children to protect them as the coffin door opens, making its way faster towards them. It closes in on the mother and reopens, showing she is gone. Screaming, the kids try to run away. The older boy trips and is quickly swallowed up by the coffin. The little girl remembers something her father told her and quickly runs to the bathroom, locking herself in. Knock, knock, knock. She desperately searches in the medicine cabinet until she finally finds the little brown bottle her father showed her. Knock, knock, knock. With the door broken down, the coffin moves to swallow the little girl. She opens the brown bottle and throws the liquid inside at it, emptying the bottle. The coffin stops in its place and begins to slowly smoke. Soon it's on fire, a terrible screeching sound emitting from it as it slowly burns to ash. The police found the girl a few days later, still clutching the bottle. When they tried to interview her to learn what happened, all she kept saying was, Vix 44 stops the coffin. He made it a very dramatic event when telling this story, making it very creepy just to end it with a punchline. I always loved hearing this for Halloween.